This is the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology YouTube channel and this video cast is part two of three on anesthesia pharmacology keyword review focusing on opioids, IV anesthetics, and volatile anesthetics. As a reminder, the keywords are published by the American Board of Anesthesia on questions that were on examinations each year distributed to program directors and programs to help us learn more about these uh, topics. The pharmacology keywords from 2019 we looked at in part one, but let's focus in on opioids, IV anesthetics, and volatiles. You can see questions like codeine and its metabolism, tramadol and its pharmacology, the biliary pressure effects of opioids, and in Inhaled anesthetics, Meyer-Overton correlation, postoperative nausea and inhalational anesthetics, nitrous oxide and airspace expansion, what happens to MAC in the elderly, and sulfur hexafluoride gas and contraindication to nitrous oxide. Things about IV anesthetics on dexmedetomine and ketamine, and um, when we look at 2018, we have questions on opioids related to renal failure and meperidine, metabolism of opioids, tolerance to opioids, seizure threshold in opioids, metabolites of morphine, and then under uh, inhaled anesthetics, blood gas coefficients, carbon monoxide and the CO2 absorbent, inhaled anesthetics and how they work, misfilled vaporizers, stages of anesthesia, DES versus SIVO, MAC and some of the factors affecting and let's move right into part two of this three-part series on pharmacology focusing on opioids, IV induction agents, and inhaled agents. Uh, and opioids first, where do they act? Periaqueductal gray area is part of the brainstem and you can see that at the top right where the periaqueductal gray area is. Substantial gelatinosa is in the spinal cord, lamina rex ed two of the dorsal horn. And if you look at the bottom right, you can see where uh, at the red circle where opioids work in the spinal cord, in the dorsal horn. And there's receptor subtypes, including mu1 when they activate, which results in analgesia, causing supraspinal and spinal effects. Mu2 is associated with respiratory depression and bradycardia. And there's other subtypes, opioid receptor mu, delta, and kappa. So if you could separate mu1 and mu2, that would be a great drug because you'd get analgesia potentially without respiratory depression. Opioids mechanism of action, what do they do? They bind to the mu receptor and inhibit release of neurotransmitters, things like acetylcholine, dopamine, norepinephrine, and substance P. And at the picture at the top right shows morphine binding to a mu receptor, G protein coupled activation of the receptor inhibits cyclic AMP and then inhibits the ion movement across calcium and potassium channels. So it's showing presynaptic calcium. If it doesn't come in as much, then you don't have as much release of these uh, neurotransmitters like substance P associated with pain transmission in this afferent C fiber or pain transmitting fiber. And postsynaptically, opioids uh, cause a efflux of potassium, which causes it to hyperpolarize or be farther from firing threshold. So two mechanisms, calcium presynaptically reduces its entry and postsynaptically enhances potassium efflux. Cardiovascular and hemodynamic effects of opioids, when we give opioids to a patient, we decrease sympathetic output from the medulla and increase parasympathetic tone via vagal pathways. There is no significant myocardial depression. The exception is high doses of Demerol, which are not used. And fentanyl, sufentanyl, remifentanyl are considered cardio-safe or cardiac anesthetics. No myocardial depression. You can get bradycardia when you administer opioids, and this is mainly through stimulation of a central vagal nucleus with vagal input to the heart, resulting in bradycardia. An exception is meperidine. Meperidine structure, chemical structure, looks like atropine, and it can actually cause tachycardia. 
Hypotension with opioids can occur secondary to this central vagally mediated bradycardia and also arterial and venous vasodilation. And some patients who are given opioids in low doses uh, for postoperative pain, if they get up rapidly, can have orthostatic hypotension. Histamine release with pruritus. Um, Demerol and morphine are the bad actors with regards to histamine release. We don't see clinically significant histamine release with sufentanil, fentanyl, remifentanil. So if you're called to the recovery room sometime and you uh, are pointed out a vein with redness along it where morphine had just been administered, that is actually histamine release in the uh, vein itself. This is not a allergic reaction. That's a relatively normal effect of morphine. It doesn't mean you have to stop giving morphine, but histamine release with morphine and meparidine. Methadone can prolong the QT interval and there's a risk of torsades to points or uh, what looks like a reciprocating tachycardia or multiform tachycardia shown in the electrocardiogram below. And methadone's effect appears to be via voltage gated potassium channels in the myocardium. So someone with a prolonged QT interval and you're thinking about opioids, methadone may not be the best choice. Central nervous system effects of opioids. What's the effect on the electrocardiogram, or the EEG, that is, electroencephalogram, and the SSEP? Uh, not a lot. BIS is not a great monitor of anesthetic depth when you have an opioid-based anesthetic. So if you have mainly remifentanil infusing, for example, it doesn't reduce the BIS much. And high doses of opioids are associated with EEG slowing and delta wave activity. They don't tend to produce evidence of seizures on the EEG, one exception being meparidine, which in repetitive doses and some with renal failure can build up the metabolite normaparidine, which causes CNS excitation and seizures. And fentanyl can lower the seizure threshold some. What do they do to brain blood flow and metabolism? Just a slight reduction, not nearly as much as our induction agents like propofol and atomidate. We know that opioids reduce MAC of volatile anesthetics but they have a ceiling effect because they're not a total anesthetic. In the elderly, we decrease the dose of opioids about in half, and mainly this is due to a pharmacodynamic changes. Their brain is more sensitive, and this includes remifentanil. They also may have a decreased clearance and uh, change in volume of distribution, um, and they may have renal insufficiency, and if they do, they may build up some of the metabolites of opioids. So in the elderly, from a pharmacodynamic changes, we reduce the dose in half and realize that their liver and their kidneys may not be as good and they may build up some of the metabolites. Stiff chest syndrome is a side effect of potent opioids like sufentanil, fentanyl, and remifentanil. If you administer them very rapidly, occasionally you'll see this. It's centrally mediated, probably dopamine or GABA receptor effects in the brain and skeletal muscle rigidity ensues as well as laryngeal muscle muscle closure and can make mask ventilation difficult or even impossible. Um, and when you push a large dose of an opioid and they develop this, how, what can you do? Well, you can give them rocuronium and reverse it, or you could potentially give an opioid antagonist like naloxone, but that probably wouldn't be the greatest idea because then you'd reverse totally your effect of your opioid that you were using as part of your induction. So stiff chest syndrome, a complication of uh, potent opioids, centrally mediated, and can uh, cause skeletal as well as laryngeal muscle closure. Some uh, opioids actually have a local anesthetic effect. Meparidine is this one, and even if you put meparidine in the subarachnoid space rather than inject it intravenously, uh, when it goes in the subarachnoid space, it can have uh, a spinal anesthetic-like effect, a local anesthetic effect. Opioid tolerance and hyperalgesia is the next topic. And when someone has a prolonged exposure to opioids, you can have activation of the NMDA receptor. Ketamine may be used in a uh, perioperative period in an attempt to decrease this uh, activation of the NMDA receptor because it appears that this is important in development of opioid tolerance and increased pain sensitivity, which we call hyperalgesia. Opioid tolerance, uh, constipation and pupillary constriction are side effects that are the least likely to develop 
tolerance to, so someone who's taking opioids chronically, still has uh, constricted pupils and still has problem with constipation. And if someone is taking opioids and um, they become tolerant to them, obviously they will have taking the same dose. Let's say they're taking five milligrams of morphine every four hours or something like that or six hours and they're getting that around the clock and they start to have more pain and more tachycardia and more hypertension related to the pain, you're saying, oh, they're becoming tolerant to that opioid. Respiratory effects, minute ventilation goes down mainly because respiratory rate goes down. Uh, at very high doses, tidal volume can also go down. Inhibits the medullary respiratory centers. The ventilatory response to carbon dioxide is affected and the CO2 response curve shifts to the right such that it takes more CO2 to stimulate us to breathe as much as we would if the opioid wasn't present. Blunt's hypoxic drive, so we're not going to breathe as fast and as high a minute ventilation if we're exposed to hypoxia, if opioids are on board. The apneic threshold, the highest CO2 where a patient remains apneic, actually increases. So if you have someone breathing uh, a, vel a sevoflurane through a laryngeal mask airway, for example, and you give them uh, some fentanyl, often their end tidal CO2 will rise. And if you try to get their CO2 down by taking over voluntary ventilation, they won't breathe on their own until their CO2 builds back up to their apneic threshold, which is often higher after the opioid it is administered. Maximum respiratory depression occurs about five to seven minutes after intravenous fentanyl and about 20 to 30 minutes after IV morphine. And this should be taken into consideration. For example, in the recovery room, if you're giving them uh, a medication and then going to transport them up to the floor, it would be unwise to give someone um, morphine and then let them go 10 minutes later to the floor because you're not seeing the maximal respiratory effect. Respiratory depression is potentiated by co-administration of other drugs like midazolam. Opioids don't interfere with hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Uh, remember that the volatile anesthetics do interfere with hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. The renal effects and metabolites of opioids. Let's go through this uh, step by step uh, with the various opioids. First of all, if someone has a single dose of morphine who's in renal failure, there's really no big alteration in disposition or worries. But it's when you start administering chronically and repetitive doses to someone who has renal failure that you start worrying about the buildup of certain metabolites. And with morphine, there can be accumulation of 6-glucuronide, that is a sugar glucuronide attached to the morphine in the sixth position, it's a metabolite, which has potent analgesic and sedative effects, and normally your kidney would get rid of this. So repetitive doses of morphine in someone with renal failure worry about the 6-glucuronide metabolite building up. With meperidine, repetitive doses over time in someone with renal failure, you can build up the metabolite normaperidine, which is neurotoxic and can cause seizures. Hydromorphone or dilated is metabolized to a 3-glucuronide metabolite, which is active and can cause cognitive dysfunction, excitation, even myoclonus, and in someone with renal failure, this metabolite builds up. Codeine can cause prolonged narcosis. It's not recommended. Fentanyl is good for use in end-stage renal disease because there's not active metabolites. And of course, remifentanil would be a reasonable choice because you don't have to have a functioning kidney or liver for that matter to clear it because it's cleared by esterases in the blood. But in elderly, remember to reduce the dose of remifentanil because they're pharmacodynamically more sensitive to all opioids. Methadone is considered relatively safe without active metabolites. So in the graphic at the top right showing recommendations for opioids and renal impairment, Codeine's not recommended, fentanyl safe, um, hydrocodone, oxycodone, cautious, uh, hydromorphone, cautious because there's some metabolites, methadone seems to be safe, don't give Demerol uh, or morphine for that matter or tramadol. GI effects of opioids, biliary pressure can go up and you cause spasm of the sphincter ovodi and common bile duct and even abdominal pain and colic-like complaints in some patients. Uh, and it can contribute to misinterpretation of intraoperative cholangiograms. If you're taking out a gallbladder 
and they uh, are worried that there might be a residual stone in the bile duct and they want to do an intraoperative cholangiogram. Opioids can actually constrict uh, the uh, sphincter vodi in the bile duct and it can look like um, a stone's present there. Now if you had to reverse the effects of the opioids on the biliary tract, you can use glucagon and naloxone. Opioids decrease GI motility, we know that. There's opioid receptors in the GI smooth muscle, their gastric emptying slowed down, they become constipated, their bowel can become distended and a paralytic ileus can occur. And there is a new peripheral mu receptor antagonist, alvipoman or Entereg, that can be used as part of ERIS protocols after GI surgery um, because it is a selective GI opioid antagonism without reversing the central analgesic effects of opioids. You get the pain relief without the slowing of the gut. Postoperative nausea and vomiting is increased when opioids are used because they stimulate the chemoreceptor trigger zone in the area postream of the brainstem and can have direct effects on the GI tract association with nausea and vomiting. Opioids and MAOI inhibitors was a key word, uh, mainly related to serotonin and its buildup or potential buildup. Meperidine or Demerol, if you add that to a patient who's on an MAOI inhibitor, drugs like the name selegiline, phenylzine, tranylcypromine, they can have a possible life-threatening reaction called serotonin syndrome associated with their temperature going up, their blood pressure going up, looks like MH, they can have muscle rigidity, seizures, coma, and death. And morphine and fentanyl don't appear to cause this. So meperidine plus an MAOI inhibitor, bad combination. Tramadol or Altram, also you would avoid with patients taking MAOI inhibitors. Tramadol's mechanism of, of action is not only mu receptor agonism, but it also increases serotonin and norepinephrine. So I think of tramadol as an analgesic antidepressant almost combination because it's not only causing analgesia through the mu receptor, but reducing uptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. It is a prodrug and it, uh, that means that it has to be metabolized by the CYP2 system uh, to an agonist uh, to be active. SSRIs, uh, TCAs, SNRIs also can interact with MAOI inhibitors and combining those uh, or starting to administer those in a patient who's on an MAOI inhibitor can result in this increase in serotonin and serotonin syndrome. And at our hospital now, uh, drugs that raise serotonin are labeled as such because of a worry of combining drugs that can raise serotonin and cause serotonin syndrome. Opioids and remifentanil. Remifentanil is similar in potency to fentanyl, about 100 times as potent as morphine. It has a very rapid onset. Uh, it's a equilibration uh, with the brain from blood into brain. It only takes just over a minute as compared with fentanyl. It takes about six minutes. So uh, when we give fentanyl, you don't see the effect immediately. The patient doesn't feel the effect immediately. Um, it takes a, a slower onset time than does a remifentanil. The metabolism of remifentanil is independent of whether you have a kidney or liver, uh, but as mentioned previously, we're still going to decrease the dose in the elderly because they're more pharmacodynamically sensitive. How is it broken down? It's broken down by ester hydrolysis, by nonspecific plasma and tissue esterases to inactive metabolites. So uh, there are multiple esterases all over the body. Uh, RBC esterases break down esmolol, nonspecific esterases break down remifentanil. Um, not pseudocolon esterase dependent, this breakdown of remifentanil. So if someone had a dibuk number of 20 indicating that they had a homozygous defect in pseudocolon esterase enzyme, it would have no effect on remifentanil metabolism. If you infuse remifentanil for an extended period of time, uh, their contact-sensitive halftime stays at about four minutes. So the contact-sensitive halftime is independent of the duration. And this is why if you're having to uh, provide opioid analgesia and want someone awakened and neurologic recovery rapid, uh, after hours of infusion of an opioid, remifentanil can work well for this. Remifentanil, like other potent uh, opioids, uh, but especially remifentanil, is associated with hyperalgesia. And remember that this is probably NMDA receptor mediated and ketamine may be used in an attempt to reduce the incidence of uh, perioperative hyperalgesia. 
Opioids agonist and antagonist is the next keyword. Nalbufene acts not only as an antagonist at the mu receptor, but as an agonist at the kappa receptor. It has sealing analgesic and respiratory depressant effects. There is, therefore, you think, well, maybe it's a little bit safer because it has a sealing respiratory uh, depressant effect. Because of its antagonism at the mu receptor, it can precipitate withdrawal symptoms in opioid-dependent patients, and occasionally it's used for labor analgesia. Buprenorphine, very potent uh, opioid. Buprenorphine plus naloxone is called suboxone and is used for treatment of opioid-addicted people. Mixed agonist and antagonist effect, 25 to 50 times as potent as morphine. High, very high affinity to the mu receptor and seems to have a sealing effect on respiratory depression. Naloxone will reverse all opioid effects, including analgesia, Narcan, the other name for this. If you have sudden and complete antagonism of opioid effects by administering naloxone to someone who's been given high doses of opioids, you can have hypertension, tachycardia, even ventricular dysrhythmias from this massive outpouring of catecholamines, and sometimes you can get pulmonary edema by unknown mechanism, possibly this centrally mediated catecholamine release with pulmonary hypertension. That is naloxone-induced side effects, cardiovascular uh, effects specifically. Naloxone has a very short duration of action, only about 60 minutes, so that if you had given someone a large opioid dose that's long-acting, like morphine or dilated, and you reversed it with naloxone in about 60 minutes, the naloxone is pretty much gone, and you may have to either start an infusion of, of naloxone if you want to block the residual opioid effects or give repetitive uh, intermittent doses. Opioids, codeine metabolism was the key word in 2019. It's in purple, representing 2019. And opioid pharmacogenetics, very interesting. Codeine's a prodrug, and its analgesia is dependent on its metabolism to morphine by a very special system, the cytochrome P450 CYP2D6 system. So it's bioactivated, starts as codeine, must be converted to morphine to be uh, metabolically active. Other uh, opioids that require bioactivation, other than codeine to morphine, tramadol to M1, oxycodone to oxymorphone, hydrocodone to hydromorphone, and this enzyme, CYP2D6, has significant gen genetic variation in activity. In fact, about a fourth of all drugs that are administered to patients depend upon this system. And about 7% of Caucasians have a defective gene resulting in hypoalgesia, analgesia that is, if they can't bioactivate some of these opioids, codeine being the example. You give codeine to some patients, uh, and they happen to be in that 7% Caucasian uh, population, codeine is going to be like water and not be converted to morphine and have its effect. There are some people that are rapid metabolizers and possibly have a genetic uh, defect or extra copies of their gene or they produce more of the uh, enzymes involved in metabolism such that they take in the drug, convert more of it, of codeine to morphine than the normal population, and they're called rapid metabolizers or ultra metabolizers. So at the graphic at the top right, you can see opioids and opioid metabolism showing codeine being converted to morphine, hydrocodone being converted to hydromorphone, uh, oxycodone being converted to oxymorphone, bioactivation, and pharmacogenetics. Opioids and abuse. Physical dependence refers to the fact that um, um, if you are taking a drug and you stop taking it, it's a state of adaptation, this physical dependence, that's manifested by a drug class specific withdrawal, like you're using fentanyl, you stop using it, and you get withdrawal syndrome from abrupt cessation or a rapid dose reduction, decreasing blood level of the drug, or administer uh, of an antagonist like naloxone. So withdrawal is part of physical dependence. Tolerance is a state of adaptation in which exposure to a drug induces changes that result in less effect of a drug over time. So you're given five milligrams of morphine every six hours 
and eventually there's less analgesia. The patient starts to have symptoms of pain and sympathetic outflow because they're tolerant to that drug. Addiction is a primary chronic or neurobiologic disease characterized by behaviors that include things like loss of control over drug use, uncontrollable compulsion to use, continued use despite harm, and a craving. So withdrawal is physical dependence, tolerance, less effects uh, with the same dose, and addiction, uh, uncontrollable compulsion, loss of control over drug use. Those are the differences between those three. Let's move on to IV induction agents. We're going to start with thiopental. Uh, thiopental is uh, very rarely used anymore. Methohexetol is another barbiturate. These are still part of the American Board of Anesthesia content outline, so we'll briefly cover them and the keywords that have been used in the past on this topic. Where do barbiturates work? Like many of our induction agents, they work at the GABA receptor, increasing chloride conductance and hyperpolarizing cells in the central nervous system. They redistribute rapidly away from the brain, and this is the reason why you awaken after most of the IV induction agents, redistribution but barbiturates are broken down very slowly in the blood. In fact, about 10 and a half hours is the half-life of hepatic metabolism. You, so you could see why someone given an IV induction dose of thiopental goes to sleep, awakens in five to 10 minutes or so, and then goes home and is groggy for up to 24 or more hours thereafter. What does thiopental do to the brain? It puts the brain cells to sleep, therefore decreasing oxygen use by the brain, CMRO2. And cerebral blood flow goes down also uh, due to cerebral vasoconstriction. There's autoregulation. If oxygen use goes down, blood flow goes down. Intracranial pressure goes down because there's less blood in the head. Cerebral blood volume goes down and intraocular pressure actually goes down. The EEG shows the effect of the barbiturates and if you give enough of it, you can cause even total flattening or at not quite so high a doses, burst suppression, which is periods of activity with periods of flattening in between. And barbiturates have been used in the past in an attempt to provide neural protection uh, with focal ischemia like stroke or uh, it doesn't work for global ischemia, but it can decrease seizures uh, and has been used uh, to suppress seizures in the setting of status epilepticus or to reduce intracranial pressure or oxygen use by the brain in the settings of brain injury. Methohexetol, occasionally used in electroconvulsive therapy or cardioversion in the past. Methohexetol is Brevitol. Um, and this methohexetol, along with ketamine and atomidate, can actually activate epileptic foci. And this may be useful when you're doing, for example, seizure surgery, where you're trying to look for the seizure foci and other anesthetics could block it and you really want to activate it so they can map it adequately and you could replace some of your other anesthetics with things like ketamine or atomidate or possibly even brevitol. Thiopental, continuing on with the barbiturate dis discussion, what does it do to the heart? It decreases blood pressure like many of our induction agents but it mainly does it through peripheral vasodilation and venodilation so preload goes down and afterload goes down. It tends to be a negative inotrope, decreasing cardiac contractility, and it doesn't blunt the baroreceptor response as much as propofol, and so heart rate will go up some. In the elderly, we decrease the dose of thiopental or brevitol if we were going to use it in them because there is pharmacokinetic differences. Basically, there's a decreased volume of central compartment and slower redistribution from the vessel-rich group like the brain to the muscle. And so I like to think of it as getting up in their, into the brain and not leaving the brain as fast. And the elderly are pharmacodynamically more, uh, um, are, uh, just the same sensitivity pharmacodynamically, their brain cells, but it's a pharmacokinetic effect. It stays up there and doesn't leave the reason behind why a decreased dose can be used in the elderly. Barbitrate enzyme induction people taking barbiturates chronically, like phenobarbital for seizures, this will induce the cytochrome P450 hepatic microsomal enzymes and increases the rate of metabolism of some of our other drugs. Chronic administration of a barbiturate will decrease the duration of action of the Dazlam, which requires these enzymes to break it down. Remember, uh, lorazepam 
its metabolism is a glucuronidation. Midazolam's metabolism is a hepatic oxidase metabolism. Opioid prodrugs like codeine, some of the codones, and tramadol uh, may actually increase the active form if you ramp up that enzyme and it produces more of the active form. Um, and you can have increased metabolism of some of the oral anticoagulants and dilantin. It enhances its own metabolism, and this is called tolerance. Acute to intermittent porphyria was a key word in 2019. What are some of the triggers for AIP? Barbiturates are contraindicated, so thiopental and brevitol. Uh, don't give them to people with AIP. Also, Valium, Tordol, and possibly Atomidate are triggers for acute intermittent porphyria. If you give these drugs, you can promote one of the enzymes involved in porphyrin metabolism, which stimulates more of these porphyrins being produced and can precipitate a crisis associated with uh, neurologic complaints, abdominal pain, confusion, hypertension, etc. Propofol is the next uh, topic. What does it do to the brain? Propofol decreases oxygen use by the brain cells as they go to sleep and therefore blood flow also goes down can decrease intracranial pressure one of the worries though about propofol is that um, it can decrease cerebral perfusion pressure which by definition is MAP minus ICP it decreases MAP a lot and decreases ICP a little so if you decrease the blood pressure a lot and only decrease the intracranial pressure a little you can negatively impact cerebral perfusion pressure Propofol also decreases intraocular pressure. If you give enough propofol, you can cause a flattening of the EEG like you did with the barbiturates. Um, and not so high doses can even get burst suppression. And if you look at your BIS monitor, if it was reading a zero and if someone who was reading 100% when they're awake, this would be a flattened EEG. Let's say it's reading 10 or 20 and has a burst suppression ratio of 50%. That would mean that 50% of the time, if the suppression ratio was 50%, 50% of the time it is flat, 50% there's activity. With propofol, sometimes you can get some twitching or spontaneous movement. Atomidate, you get a little bit more of this myoclonic activity, but propofol is safe to use with a seizure disorder. In fact, if you use propofol for ECTs, you're going to shorten the seizure uh, disorder, the seizure activity, and you really want seizures to occur when you're using ECT to treat uh, depression, for example and uh, big doses of propofol to put someone to sleep for an ECT can make it hard to get that seizure activity and you may want to substitute propofol with something else um, uh, if you're having problems getting long enough seizures. Cardiovascular effects of propofol, blood pressure drops. Why does it drop? Because you vasodilate and venodilate and it markedly inhibits the baroreceptor. So as your blood pressure drops, you would expect the heart rate to pick up but uh, in the case of propofol on board, the baroreceptors are blocked and you don't get that reflexive tachycardiac, tachycardia. It's a negative inotrope, so it reduces cardiac contractility. And you know that as you give an induction dose of propofol, what happens? They stop breathing, become apneic. Respiratory depression is a part of uh, propofol side effects. And a good thing about propofol, it is a bronchodilator. Propofol infusion syndrome refers to um, a rare syndrome occurring uh, in critically ill children and adults that are receiving high dose infusions of propofol, often the intensive care unit, uh, days of propofol infusion going in and the patient develops unexpected, initially tachycardia followed by resistant bradycardia and acidosis on blood gases, uh, lactate buildup, they can even have muscle breakdown and heart failure. And the likely etiology is this propofol with all its lipid in mitochondria that just aren't working well. The lipid builds up, you have mitochondrial failure, failure, and if your energy factories aren't working well, the muscle can break down and the heart doesn't work as well. Bacterial growth can also occur with propofol. The lipid emulsion can support it. And if you open propofol, it's been rec uh, recommended that you don't leave it open for an extended period of time because bacteria can grow in it. Atomidate's the next uh, drug that we're talking about. Next key word, what does it do to the brain? It decreases oxygen use like our other induction agents and therefore blood flow goes down and intracranial pressure. Unlike 
uh, propofol, which really dropped our mean arterial pressure, Atomidate maintains mean arterial pressure, but also drops intracranial pressure, and therefore can have a favorable effect on cerebral perfusion pressure and its maintenance. You can see ex excitatory spikes on the electroencephalogram after administration of Atomidate, and it may activate seizure foci. Myoclonus is not uncommon when you give an induction agent like Atomidate, and patients start moving, and but they're asleep. You say, hmm, did I give succinylcholine? Sometimes it looks a little bit like that, and myoclonus is what is occurring. Suppression of the adrenal cortex is associated with atomate because it inhibits an enzyme called 11-beta-hydroxylase. That enzyme is involved in the conversion of cholesterol to cortisol, but also uh, to uh, mineral corticoids. So both glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids are reduced after Atomidate is given. However, it's a very short period of time that it does so. Rarely is it a clinical issue. Infusions for a long period of time in the past and single doses in patients who are cortisol depleted, like an Addison's patient or an ICU patient who's been on high dose adrenergic agents for a long period of time, um, you may uh, uh, think twice about using Atomidate in those situations. PONV. Uh, atomidate or vomidate, as some of us call it, because it increases postoperative nausea and vomiting, and it hurts when you inject it. We always associate pain on injection with propofol, but atomidate also is painful on injection, uh, much more than our drugs like uh, brevitol, thiopental, or ketamine. Ketamine is the next topic. The receptors, cardiovascular effects, and side effects were the key words from in the past. Ketamine acts at the NMDA receptor as opposed to the GABA receptor like many of our other drugs. Its main analgesic action is via that receptor, decreasing excitatory transmitter activity and dissociating the thalamus from the cortex, therefore the name dissociative anesthesia. In the heart, it causes release of endogenous in, in, uh, catecholamines, not in the heart itself, but uh, from uh, neurons, sympathetic neurons, and those Catecholamines then have their effect on the heart, increasing heart rate and blood pressure, and can cause pulmonary vasoconstriction. Uh, this increase in pulmonary artery pressures, which makes it not a great choice in patients with pulmonary hypertension, doesn't seem to occur in infants and young children. And we will use ketamine in children with congenital heart disease, even if they have elevations in pulmonary artery pressure. Ketamine, its indirect effect is raising endogenous catecholamines, but its direct effect is myocardial depression. So if you denervated the heart and then exposed it to ketamine, you may unmask the direct myocardial depressant effect. Well, what type of patients are denervated? Um, spinal cord transection at high level loses its thoracic input. Uh, ICU patients on multiple infusions of inotropes and vasopressors act like they're denervated, and you may have direct myocardial depressant effect when you give ketamine. And so you give ketamine and they get hypotensive and you wonder, that's not supposed to happen. Uh, think about this. Ketamine increases cardiac work and increases myocardial oxygen consumption and may not be a great choice in someone at risk for uh, myocardial ischemia, secondary to coronary artery disease. Some other effects, side effects and uses of ketamine. It is a bronchodilator. It increases secretions from its uh, 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 stimulation of the cholinergic uh, tone, sympathetic cholinergic mediated. It can cause emergence delirium, and this emergence delirium is increased if you give a drug like atropine to decrease the secretions associated with ketamine. Uh, when you administer uh, ketamine plus atropine together, atropine goes up there and uh, increases the emergence delirium. It crosses the blood brain barrier, and glycopyrrolate is a better choice because it being a tertiary amine doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. And so if you want to decrease secretions associated with ketamine, glycopyrrolate's a much better choice. And ketamine doesn't have a much effect on the BIS, and so you can give large doses of ketamine and still have a BIS reading in high numbers. Um, it may help prevent hyperalgesia um, because of its effect on the NMDA receptor and reduce, reduction in opioid use. And ketamine's being used more and more in the uh, in the perioperative period uh, and intraoperative period to reduce our dose of opioids and potentially reduce this hyperalgesia. Infusions of ketamines are being used in very low doses in infusion clinics to treat people with intractable depression now. 
Anesthetic effects on EEG, SSEP, and BIS. Now we're looking at all types of anesthetics right now. Um, EEG, in general, the anesthetic effect is one of decreasing the frequency. As someone goes off to sleep, they're slowing away from alpha and beta waves, which are fast waves, down towards delta and theta waves, which are slow waves. And so the frequency goes down and the amplitude tends to go up. And propofol, the barbiturates, atomidate tend to act like this. The exception, opioids and ketamine don't have this classic effect of decreasing the frequency and slowing it and increasing the amplitude. There are some drugs that can activate seizure foci. For example, electroconvulsive therapy and seizure surgery, they may be beneficial. Methylhexatol and atomidate stand out here. SSCPs, when we're monitoring them, such as in back surgery, somatosensory evoked potentials, most of our anesthetics can make it take longer for the signal to get through, that's latency, and decrease the amplitude, which is the height of it. And in the far right, you can see a picture of a stimulus being applied, the latency being the time to the first peak. If it's a positive peak, that's called P, and if it's the first one, it can be called P1 or P10, if it's 10 milliseconds after uh, the stimulus is applied till it reaches that point where it's being uh, recorded. So onset is latency, amplitude uh, is the peak, and our volatile anesthetics can have effect on these uh, as well as our intravenous anesthetics. And across the board, most of our drugs have this effect of making it take it longer to get through and reducing the amplitude and making it harder to read SSCPs uh, monitoring them during surgery. An exception is atominate and ketamine that can actually increase the amplitude. BIS, opioids, ketamine, nitrous oxide confound the use of BIS as a monitor of hypnosis or sleep because they don't have the usual effect of decreasing the frequency and increasing the amplitude on an EEG, which the BIS depends on a process EEG uh, to put out that number between 0 and 100. Obesity and intravenous anesthetics. What about non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents first, like rock uranium? There's little change in volume of distribution with obesity. Non-depolarizing uh, neuromuscular blocking agents are ionized molecules that pretty much stick to the water space of the body. The dose is often based upon ideal body weight, but we can add 20% or more to include the extra lean mass associated with carrying around all of this extra adipose tissue. So ideal body weight plus 20% is often a way to dose non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. Succinylcholine, the dose is usually increased, secondary to the fact that obese patients have increased pseudocholinesterase activity. They have more of the drug that breaks it down. So 1.5 milligrams per kilogram uh, times ideal body weight uh, is one way to dose it. Now lipophilic drugs, theoretically there's a large fat store to provide a larger volume of distribution for drugs like opioids and benzodiazepines and propofol, and a larger loading dose would be required to produce the same plasma concentration, but most will dose uh, based on ideal body weight uh, uh, plus some factor. Remifentanil, the pharmacokinetics are similar to the non-obese patient and we dose on a deal body weight in general. Awakening times for volatile anesthetics if you're administering it uh, for a very small number of hours, very similar between obese and non-obese patients, but uh, volatile agents like desflurane and sevoflurane with low blood gas solubilities would, uh, would be uh, offer some benefits, that is, if you were giving a long anesthetic where the volatile anesthetic could build up in the fat and delay awakening. Inhaled anesthetics, nitrous oxide, next uh, keyword topic. What does nitrous oxide do to the brain? It actually increases cerebral blood flow. And this is in comparison to when we were talking about our intravenous anesthetics that decrease cerebral blood flow. And it may decrease uh, SSEP signals. Its MAC is over 100%, so you cannot even give one MAC of nitrous oxide, very non-potent volatile anesthetic. 0.5 MAC uh, then would be about 400 millimeters of mercury. Um, we get that because that would be about 55% or so of the total atmospheric pressure of 760, which you would have to give then about 400 millimeters of mercury to get a half a MAC. 
So to get a MAC, you'd have to administer nitrous oxide under hyperbaric conditions. Cardiovascular system, there's a tendency of nitrous oxide to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, and you might get a slight increase in heart rate, blood pressure, and cardiac output. And nitrous oxide can actually increase the pulmonary vascular resistance in adults and may not be the best choice and often uh, contraindicated in patients with pulmonary hypertension because of this increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. Respiratory system, minimal change in minute ventilation and effects on arterial CO2, but hypoxic drive is depressed, just like the volatile anesthetics. And one thing unique to nitrous oxide is this concept of diffusion hypoxia shown on the far right, where let's say at the end of an anesthetic, where you were administering 50% nitrous and uh, a half MAC of sevoflurane, you turn off the anesthetic to awaken the patient, but instead of giving 100% oxygen or supplemental oxygen, you gave them room air. Their alveolus would have room air in it, and as the nitrous came from the blood and rushed back into the alveolus, it would dilute the oxygen that is in the alveolus and drop that oxygen, and you can have diffusion hypoxia occur. A dental office would be another situation where if someone was breathing 40 to 60% nitrous oxide and uh, only supplemental air was given to the patient as they recovered from the nitrous oxide, you could have a drop in the pulse oximeter reading because of diffusion hypoxia. Problems with nitrous oxide, one is megaloblastic anemia, big red blood cells, peripheral neuropathy. Because nitrous oxide oxidizes the cobalt atom in B12 and inhibits the enzyme methionine synthetase, which is important for myelin formation and DNA formation. Classic example, a dentist who was abusing nitrous oxide comes in to a family practitioner or internist, complains of uh, glove stocking like neuropathy, and you do blood samples from them, and you happen to see big red blood cells, and you think, boy, are they drinking too much alcohol? Why do, do they have a B12 deficiency? and then you realize megaloblastic anemia plus peripheral neuropathy and ask about nitrous oxide exposure and uh, possible abuse of nitrous oxide. Teratogenic effects, possible with nitrous oxide, so we avoid in pregnancy. We know that nitrous oxide expands air spaces that have nitrogen in them because it's 35 times more soluble than nitrogen. It rushes into air spaces, nitrogen can't leave, and so the air spaces build up. If there was an air embolism, a pneumothorax, a tension pneumocephalus like that can occur at the end of brain surgery where they close the dura and leave air uh, closed in the dura. If you were giving nitrous oxide, it could expand that uh, subdural uh, space that had air in it. Bullous cysts in a bad, someone with bad COPD could actually blow a cyst. Middle ear, sulfur hexafluoride is a gas that ophthalmologists will put in the back of the eye after retinal uh, tear surgery. And someone who has that gas bubble in the back of their eye, if they're given nitrous oxide, within about a four week period after that gas bubble's been used, it can expand the gas bubble and could raise intraocular pressure. The cuff of our endotracheal tube, over a period of time, if you filled it with air, nitrous oxide goes in and can build up the pressure greater than that 25 to 30 centimeters of water pressure that we are told not to exceed in the tracheal mucosa because of potential reduction in capillary blood flow of the trachea. The bowel can be distended a lot, so someone with a bowel obstruction, volvulus or otherwise, uh, nitrous oxide would not be a, be a good choice. The nitrous tank, we know it's blue colored and it's a combination of liquid plus gas, unlike oxygen, which is only a gas. Um, the critical temperature is by definition, uh, the temperature, if you're above it, no matter how much pressure you apply to a gas, you cannot put it into the liquid form. Well, the critical temperature of nitrous oxide is 36.4 degrees. So if you pressurize it enough, you can get a liquid, and we do. Um, oxygen has a critical temperature of more than um, minus 100. It's about a minus 110. So obviously, unless you ha can find a way to get that oxygen down to that temperature or below, you can't apply enough pressure to make it go into a uh, liquid state. So our blue tank has liquid and uh, gas in it, and it will read a pressure of about 70, 750 PSI until all the liquid's gone and you start using up the gas. And that is about 
the point where you've used up uh, more than 20, uh, more used up more than 75% and have less than 25% left. A full tank is about uh, 1,600 liters of gas and about 750 psi. And when the pressure gauge begins to drop, again, you've used up the liquid and you only have about a fourth of the tank left. A fourth of 1,600 would be about 400 liters left in that tank. To know how much is left, you would have to know the weight of the tank and then uh, the tear weight of the tank and then weigh it again uh, when liquid's present uh, to be able to know how much is left because we can't follow the pressure gauge uh, because it doesn't drop until all the liquid is gone. MAC, MAC is highest at about six months of age. Um, it, things that increase it are things that increase central neurotransmitters like acute amphetamine toxicity, MAOI inhibitors, being hot, hyperthermia, chronic ethanol use, and hypernatremia. These are things associated with increasing MAC while aging and being cold and pregnant and acutely intoxicated with alcohol and any other anesthetic like lidocaine or fentanyl, midazolam, those things decrease MAC. MAC correlates with solubility in olive oil. And this is not blood gas solubility. This is how soluble it is in olive oil. And the more soluble it is in olive oil, the more potent it tends to be, um, and, um, which is MAC. So the MAC of isofluorine is 1.2%, so you, that would be very soluble in olive oil compared to desfluorine, where the MAC is approximately 6%. MAC decreases with age, about 6% per decade after age 40, such that an 80-year-old would have 25% or more uh, decrement in MAC as compared to an 40-year-old. Uh, Neonates and premature infants have the lowest MAC, and we already said the highest MAC is at six months, and then it decreases as we age. The MAC of sevoflurane varies uh, somewhat between uh, age of neonates, infants, versus older infants. Um, MAC as a partial pressure is a good way to think of MAC because really it's not a percent that's important. It is the partial pressure which drives it into our brain that is important. So if we think of desfluorine 6% as one MAC, we should say 6% at one atmosphere because 6% times 760 is 46 millimeters of mercury. That's really how much it takes to keep 50% of people from moving to incision. It's the partial pressure, not the percentage, that's the driving force for anesthetic to cross lipid membranes. MAC bar is MAC block adrenergic reflex. We know that at one MAC, 50% of people don't move to incision. 1.3 times MAC, 95% of patients don't move to incision. It takes 1.5 MAC to keep half of people uh, from uh, not having an adrenergic response of hypertension and tachycardia to stimulation, and that's called MAC bar. Meyer Overton principle is the correlation between lipid solubility and potency of anesthetics. That is, the more lipid soluble it is, the more potent it tends to be. And this is what was used to support the concept that volatile anesthetics mode of action was the lipid bilayer in many years past. And we should not confuse this with volatile anesthetic site of action. We now know that the site of action of our volatile anesthetics like DES, SIVO, ISO is actually the proteins in the membranes and the receptors themselves in the membranes and it's affecting many different systems, GABA and uh, others. So this is the end of part three of Pharmacology Keyword Review. Um, I hope you have a really good day.